primarily do my clinical clinical practice in uh, emergency medicine rurally, uh, which lends itself to um, a lot of cool research uh, and technology development for space and space-like and austere environments. And um, this is my fourth of four sessions teaching this uh, semester. Um, so there will be some throwback to some of the other stuff that we've talked about, but you don't need to have any prior knowledge to coming to this course. Um, today we're going to be talking all about immersive technologies and specifically we're going to give you definitions of what that means and by the end of this course, about maybe 30 minutes of this will be lecture and then the rest of it is hands-on time for you to actually get a sense of how we leverage immersive technologies um, for clinical care, education, training and even diagnostic imaging. So uh, learning objectives are um, have a sense of what uh, different types of immersive technologies are. Um, how they can be employed in medicine, and also how they can be employed in austere environments, remote and resource-limited resource -limited environments. So um, you may see a lot of logos. So most of my uh, lectures are non-commercial. This one is fairly commercial because I do also hold a position as the VP of Immersive Medicine with Luxonic Technologies. So all of the software you're going to see today is has been developed through Luxonic. Um, so my job with them is to help guide the clinical content um, and make sure it's you know actually useful for clinicians. Um, the other thing I'll add is um, if you have questions at any point throughout, um, go ahead and ask them and we will hopefully address them. Okay, so what do we mean by immersive technologies? So immersive technologies is any type of technology that gives you a sense of being in a different reality. And what would be the example of the lowest tech form of an immersive technology? A book. A book, okay, perfect. You didn't even see my slides. Yeah, exactly, and that's why we have this picture here. Is it's given, the formal definition is to give the perception of being physically present in a different world. So that is a low tech, you don't need to plug in anything, you don't need power to have, be immersed in a different world. Um, this lecture, we're going to talk about several definitions. So we're going to talk about 360 um, video. So we're, that will be one of the demos that you'll be going through today. Um, and that is literally being able to experience another environment, have a 3D feel, have the um, four cardinal directions, the up and the down. And what you'll see in the demo I've loaded is um, how to reduce an anterior shoulder dislocation on an airplane because um, it's an austere environment. Um, uh, teaching video. So that's um, one example of immersive technologies. Um, the one that we all think about, obviously, when we think about immersive is virtual reality. So when we talk about our virtual world, we talk about a whole, wholly reconstructed digital world. And so you're interacting with a world that is wholly in the digital space. There's no physical um, assets there. Um, and then in between, we talk about mixed and augmented reality. So they're often used interchangeably, but there's a slight difference between the two. So when we talk about augmented reality, we talk about creating digital overlays on our physical world. So you can actually see the world around you when you're in this digital world, but you create overlays. So maybe there's an information um, box over a, uh, whatever you're studying. And so we'll talk about how that's applied to anatomy. And then of course, the extension of that is mixed reality using your um, digital overlay to actually interact with the world around you. So the third headset you'll be you'll be going through two Oculus 2s, which are virtual reality based, and a MetaQuest Pro, which is mixed reality based, and that will give you a very cool demo. Um, we'll talk about later what you're actually going to experience in which you get to use augmented reality to interact with your environment. So. How do we use them in medical education? So it's not just um, my, our work here at Luxonic. Uh, since I'd say over the past five plus years, um, immersive technologies are being increasingly used for education, for um, treatment, for patient familiarization, um, all across Canada. So here's a snapshot from Grand Rounds through Pediatrics um, in 2019. I think this was out of the University of Manitoba. And they were talking about um, how they employed augmented and virtual reality in medical education. Uh, famously, Microsoft and HoloLens uh, created some anatomy and teaching collaborations with Case Western and Cleveland Clinic um, for mixed reality anatomy-based teaching. And then even our colleagues over in the UK, surgeons are using augmented reality for um, study, for anatomy teaching, for surgical planning. And we've, uh, it's also been studied for its applications in um, 
helping students learn and test as well. So in this particular study, they used traditional PowerPoint versus um, HoloLens for teaching um, memory recall for physiology. And interestingly enough, it actually didn't help with the technical points, but it helped with test taking and test preparation. Um, yeah. So this is a video of how HoloLens is used. Let's see if it plays. Uh, for anatomy teaching. We'll go ahead and show this. If it will play. Try that one more time. Oh, um, I have a different screen playing here, so what we'll do. Um, I'll turn to one of the T's. Do you know how to share the screen if it's playing on a different tab? Um, if you press share screen, sometimes you can choose which tab you want to share. So maybe stop your current share and then try to share again. This is not my laptop, so I'm not familiar with where things are. This is your laptop, Dr. Yes. Yeah. Are you duplicating your screens or extending them? Do you know? I don't know. You know what, that's fine. We can continue on with teaching, and then um, at the end we can work on pulling this up while the rest um, are going through the screens. Okay. So I will come back. So the other challenge is finding my PowerPoint. I might need you after all, Kim. about immersive for teaching, for cost efficacy, for um, its ability to help learners retain. So um, it shows faster time to learning um, versus and the, the gold standards classroom-based learning or e-learning, um, greater learner retention, uh, even at four months post when testing, up to 50% cost savings, um, more emotionally connected content, and you're probably thinking, I'm not that emotionally connected to my PowerPoint slides, but you'll see when we go through some of the teaching modules um, what it's like to experience um, an OR simulation, for example, in 360, um, because you actually feel like you're in the environment. And for who here has actually experienced 360 video before? You guys have? Who, who has not experienced 360 video? Who has not experienced any form of VR so far? OK, so a bunch of you. So it's, it, you'll be surprised when you actually go through the simulations as to how real you perceive it to be. The first time I was testing out a clinical case in one of our learning modules, um, I was testing out using a stethoscope on our patient, and then I had this moment where I actually took a step back and realized I was treating um, the auscultation of the chest as if it were real, and it was very much immersed in, um, uh, in that scenario. Um, so we talked about knowledge retention, we talked about cost savings, we talked about emotional connection to the content. Um, and then also um, more focus. So hopefully it's becoming apparent why this is useful for um, as an adjunct to teaching to learning. Uh, and then the other thing is retiring risk. So how many of you have had to perform a procedure yet? You guys maybe, yeah. And did you, did you have to say to the patient, hey, it's, this is my first time performing this procedure? They were sedated. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> that, that helps. Um, so, but as you go on through your clinical um, uh, careers, there will be many firsts. And the first time you put a scalpel to a patient, the first time you do an art line, the first time you intubate someone, you know, it is pretty nerve wracking uh, for you. And if the patient is aware, it's kind of nerve wracking for them as well. Um, so being able to retire that risk and build that muscle memory before you ever touch the patient is also critical. Um, so those are the other two superpowers of uh, immersive. So I'm just going to take you through some of the um, software that we've created um, and what we've done. So the first um, uh, headset that we'll take you through, or maybe that's the second one, we'll figure out which one, uh, is MedCast 360. So this is our 360 um, video learning modules. And so basically here's a snapshot from one of the partnerships we did with Sask Poly. 
um, which is a and with their nursing school and basically you're seeing the entire OR this is a laparoscopic cholecystectomy and you're we're orientating the nurse from the point of view of the circulating nurse so when you're in the headset you go from this 2D image to actually seeing and hearing the sounds of the OR and if you look up there's the um, OR lights if you look down there's the OR floor and the idea is you have a sense of what your position is in the room before you ever get there. So we've run other case studies. We've run them um, also with ultrasound training for telerobotics. And probably one of my other favorite case studies is uh, working with the Department of Pediatrics. So who here has had an experience with pediatric populations? Are they inexperienced? Are they always compliant? <laughs> no. <laughs> so especially that's especially true of MRIs. So as you can imagine, kids aren't fans of being sedated or aren't fans of being uh, confined. So when you're putting a kid through an MRI, most of the time they have to be sedated. And so what we did in this next study is we partnered um, with one of the Saskatchewan um, pediatric hospitals and orientated um, patients, pediatric patients, to what the MRI environment would be like in 360 video prior to them going through um, the MRI. And in all but one case, all of the patients were able to forego sedation because they had that familiarization. So not being able to sedate or not needing to sedate kids um, is a pretty big win. Um, so the next, uh, one of the next suites you may experience if we have time, it's not quite loaded up yet, is diagnostic imaging. And so um, most of you would have experienced schooling through the pandemic, yes? Yeah. And so what was your experience going through the pandemic? You were out, <laughs> some of you look like you're kind of fighting back towards. <laughs> That good, eh? So you guys, were, uh, you guys were at home, you were out of the classroom, you weren't in the physical workspace. And for the radiologists, you were, they weren't able to um, necessarily have access to their physical workspace, or if you're a resident or a med student, you weren't able to go in and learn. Um, the other component of being have, having access to a, physio, um, a physical radiology workflow is you need the physical space and you need high resolution monitors. And uh, without that, you don't have the radiology workflow. And so in the pandemic, uh, healthcare workers, learners, lost access to their traditional physical learning and workspaces. And so um, the other um, product you'll experience today is uh, the world's first digital twin of a radiology reading room. So the entire workflow um, that a radiologist might see from their high resolution monitors to their markup tools um, we've replicated in um, VR with Health Canada and FDA approval. Um, so it can be used for education, it can be used for diagnostics, um, and you'll see what that 3D world is like. Um, so that is currently commercially available. Um, I should have updated that to say FDA approval as well, and is undergoing clinical and educational rollout uh, in North America. Um, and we've also done, as you'll see, some cool space environment testing, which I think is coming a bit later. Um, so when you slip on the headset, we'll have to switch because um, that's on one of the headsets that's loaded with um, one of the other software suites. Um, this is kind of what you'll see. So we'll start with something easy like a normal chest x-ray and take you through the markup tools. Um, so I won't play any of the videos now just so we don't have to um, uh, keep switching through videos. Um, so the third thing that you'll experience today Actually, before we go to that, so here is some of the austere environment testing that we've done for the um, digital radiology suite. So um, this is, uh, for those of you, of you who've been here before, um, you know that I do a lot of austere environment testing. Um, I've been part of an, two Aquanaut missions now, so we've taken this radiology suite underwater. Um, so in, what we did in this demonstration is I was the crew medical officer, and what I did was I uh, Started, kicked up the uh, digital twin of the radiology reading room, um, the diagnostic imaging suite, and I was able to link up with the head of radiology 4,600 kilometers away, and together we were able to review the imaging of a simulated trauma patient. So actually what I'm seeing in my headset is what's displayed on the screen here, and the remote expert is able to give me um, a read in real time and tell me what I'm seeing. Uh, from thousands of kilometers away. So hopefully it's becoming apparent that not only as a uh, educational tool, but as a consultation and collaborative tool um, for clinical application, there's also value there. And then also, if you remember the space medicine lecture, when we don't have access to a lot of space, um, when we don't have access to um, a lot of resources, 
having access to on the ground support becomes also more valuable. So speaking of space, we've also completed uh, microgravity testing in parabolic flight. So for those of you who weren't here for the zero G or for the space lecture, um, we talked about parabolic flight and how it's a good way of simulating periods of zero G for 20 seconds at a time. Um, so this is me in 2019. I was testing a different experiment. I was testing a biomonitor, but there's my um, teammate Heidi, and you can see that she's uh, deployed the Seabird suite. Um, the diagnostic imaging suite in virtual reality and um, just as a proof of concept for space-like environments. Okay, so the third virtual um, reality-based learning platform is um, something we used to call Caregiver, but and I'll just keep calling it Caregiver for use, um, uh, for ease of uh, reference. So remember we talked about building up muscle memory, retiring risk, practicing high-risk procedures before you ever stick a needle into a patient before you ever line them, before you ever um, uh, use a scalpel. And so that's what our caregiver module is. We've created, we use it um, a little bit for education, but more so for certification to training and standardization. So we worked with the Saskatchewan College of Paramedics and the Saskatchewan Society for Medical Lab Techs. The company's based in Saskatchewan, that's why there's a lot of Saskatchewan based stuff. Um, and so what we've done is we've created airway modules, cardiac modules, um, and sepsis modules for paramedic certification. So anyone who needs to be certified at the provincial level has to meet those same standards. And so that's um, the benefit of this is it's very objective, it's repeatable um, because the modules don't change between learners or between assessors. And so here's a snapshot. This is the one you'll try out today. This is one of our airway modules. So it starts with the really simple stuff. So when you first um, slip on the module, uh, you'll be in this slightly suspect um, back alley and you'll see someone who is a downed patient, they're kind of snoring and your job is to um, use your phantom hands and just perform an airway maneuver to do a um, head tilt chin lift, chin lift to open up their maneuver and then as the um, scenario goes on you probably won't be able to get through a single uh, scenario and it may be a little bit confusing because you'll be picking up where the last person picked, uh, picked off. Um, or left off, but you'll be um, experiencing different airway maneuvers all the way up to intubation. Um, and if um, we won't be doing the medical lab tech one today, but um, in that option, in that mo module, we teach uh, medical lab techs principles and orientation to the med um, to the medical lab, how to pipette, how to look through um, a microscope and uh, count. Um, for a urinalysis within looking look at a high powered field and. Um, uh, figure out what the cell counts are, figure out how to count casts, for example, in your analysis. So it's actually quite immersive because the microscope functions as a what microscope, uh, microscope would. And then on the space side, what we've done for um, the Canadian Space Agency in the past is we've built a sepsis module that allows us to build in a whole bunch of procedures, including lines and IVs. Um, and the reason for that is currently, um, on the International Space Station, you aren't guaranteed to have a doctor. Sometimes you will, but it's not guaranteed. Um, you will have, a, at the very least, a crew medical officer with somewhere between 15 to 40 hours of training. Um, but they may have had no medical training in their background prior to their CMO training. And so imagine that you first learned to pick, uh, put an IV into a patient uh, nine months prior to your mission on Earth, and then you don't practice that skill. And then the next time you're called to use that skill is when you're on the ISS. Uh, and if you don't practice that skill, your poor patient's going to look like a pincushion. Um, so, and I was relating that to one of the um, retired astronauts, and he laughed because he literally was in that position. He was a CMO. He had to stick in an IV, and he had lost that skill. And um, in his words, had stuck his patient 14 times, which isn't pleasant for anyone involved. So if you can practice those skills, um, it's uh, your retiring risk. So again, we'll skip through the videos. Um, okay, that's fine. Um, so that brings us to. Um, so currently, um, we have uh, we've talked about the projects that we've done with the Canadian Space Agency um, and with the regulatory bodies, and um, some of the work plans we have to test in increasingly high fidelity space-like environments. And um, so the last thing that you will experience today is probably one of my favorite um, uh, modules, so point of care ultrasound. So um, those of you who are going through medical training know how critical it is for bedside um, assessment, um, it can affect your management um, capabilities. 
Um, and so the problem with ultrasound is it can be bulky. If you've been in the emergency department, it can be 400 pounds. It's not easy to cart around. I work all over the province. Many of the sites I work in don't even have an ultrasound. And if you're in a trauma situation, it can be the difference between um, medevacing a patient out versus monitoring them in your facility. Um, they're not easily accessible. They can be, the new ones are like Ferraris. They're hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, you're kind of scared to touch them because you may break them by even just looking at it. Um, and then the handheld ultrasounds, like the butterflies, they're great, but what we've heard is that the displays aren't that big. So they're, you kind of, at, at the uh, win of having something that's portable, you don't get the um, uh, view that you want. So what we've done is we have um, worked with one of the major providers to create a um, transducer that plugs in directly to the um, mixed reality headset. Um, you'll see, you can see that right there. In fact, you'll get to test it out today. And we've also built those same collaboration, real-time collaboration and consultation abilities that we've built into our virtual um, reality radiology suite into that same headset. So we've also done some uh, austere environment testing on this. This is the second Aquanaut mission that we did. We did it um, earlier this year in May, and you can see that we are um, simulating a trauma scan on a patient underwater. And what um, I'm seeing is my screen is here in front of me. And so this is kind of what we mean by mixed reality in that I have a functional overlay that allows me um, to still interact with my environment, but also um, gives me more information uh, without bulk keeping me in the physical world. Okay, we've also used it for teaching purposes. So here's one of my space medicine students. Um, she's um, doing a scan. Her view screen is over here. And then what she's seeing, we've actually cast it to um, uh, the TV so you can see um, what she's seeing up here. And um, if we can today, we should actually work on casting um, the mixed reality headset so everyone can see kind of the same uh, field of view. We also did some really cool testing with that in the Arctic Circle um, this year. Um, this was to demonstrate that even without real-time collaboration uh, or connectivity, you can still use this as a standalone point of care ultrasound. Um, so for those of you who did attend the Space Medicine Lecture, um, so the features of this, it's low cost, low volume, low mass, it's easy to use, it's portable, it's ruggedized. I hope that's starting to sound familiar because um, some of the takeaways from the Space Medicine Lecture, other than space is trying to kill you, is that there are a few conser considerations with long duration space flight. Um, one of those being, if you recall, the risk of skills deterioration. And so um, when we talk about the risk of skills deterioration uh, and inadequate human computer interaction, uh, we need to talk about mitigating those risks to make the overall mission um, uh, likelihood of success greater. And so at the same time, in that lecture, we talked about the challenges of packing for the space flight environment. And again, we talked about very, very similar principles. Um, what we bring with us is limited by the space we have, the power we have, how easy it is to use, how much time the astronaut has, and how hardy it is. So again, low mass, low volume, low cost, easy to use, uh, intuitive, and hardy. So returning to that risk that we saw on the NASA research roadmap of um, long duration mission risks, skills deterioration, either we could practice, um, but we may not have the physical setup all the time, um, or we could um, let that skill deteriorate, or what would be ideal, and this is dating myself a little bit, um, you could upload skills to your brain just like in the matrix. So VR is kind of a step towards doing that. And there are a lot of applications for VR in space. Um, NASA has a really good article called, called Nine Applications of VR and AR in Space. Um, here's how they've used it in the past. This is one of their underwater aquanaut missions. They deployed the HoloLens. That was the first underwater um, deployment of mixed reality in an aquanaut setting. Um, this, as you may recall, is from their NEMO missions. Um, in, maybe this isn't the NEMO missions, but some of their other underwater work. Um, so they've also flown the HoloLens up to the International Space Station uh, for just-in-time training. And so what they've done is they've used um, an augmented reality overlay. So the instructions of what they're trying to do pops up as they're trying to go through their checklists. So here's a snapshot for what we've built for the Canadian Space Agency. We Here's a snapshot of a um, trauma scenario on the moon. And um, what we've done in that scenario is uh, create an interactive scenario in which you can examine your patient afterwards. 
So coming back to the question we asked during the space medicine lecture is, well, what about not just meeting the standard of care, but surpassing it? So when we talk about limitations both in space and in rural and remote communities, we talk about being resource limited, isolated, confined, confined with space. And so hopefully we're, we're identifying both an emerging technology space as well as a problem space. And through this lecture, we're seeking to close that gap. So here's a slide put up by Oculus, and they talk about the superpowers of um, virtual reality. And some of them we've already talked about. So we talked about risk retirement, uh, risk uh, retiring risk, and unlimited reviews. So if you are practicing a procedure on a patient and you nick the artery, that's it. Your attending's stepping in, you're going to be benched for the rest of that procedure. If you do that in the VR world, yes, you can. You will have to restart the scenario, but you can restart until you have finessed that skill. Um, you can interact with 3D objects and in, uh, add metadata, so you can add information to your physical world. Um, you can practice very impossible scenarios. So, how many times are you going to practice a thoracotomy in the trauma bay? Hopefully none, but you should still know how to do that skill. So you can practice um, impossible scenarios. Um, and we've talked all about some of these already about muscle memory, um, cost savings. Um, there's also collaboration, so we've also built um, some other scenarios with, uh, uh, for example, advanced trauma life support, where you can actually have multiplayer scenarios where you can all kind of work on your roles uh, in a trauma setting. So hopefully this is becoming, kind of coming back to earth a little bit. This slide is from our space medicine slide, and we talked about, well, what does the ISS have in common with our most remote and rural communities? And it's that they are forms of isolated, confined, extreme environments, in that they are resource limited. And so that's important to note because almost half of the world's population by the 2019 census is remote and rural. Uh, and we also all experienced a remote, and uh, not a remote, but a resource limited environment during the pandemic. Um, and kind of learned that pandemic life was an austere environment with the loss of our traditional physical working and learning spaces. So stepping back, stepping back from um, the Luxonic side, what does the future of immersive hold for medicine? So integration with other emerging technologies, uh, integration with big data, uh, integration with uh, artificial intelligence, with machine learning, to add insights, for example, into your learning when you practice a procedure, to help um, with diagnosis when reviewing diagnostic imaging. Uh, in fact, the College of Family Physicians uh, has uh, had CME uh, modules uh, and dedicated efforts towards uh, studying AI and how it will affect the future of um, family doctors. Um, and hopefully we can see the integration of these emerging technologies in a way that augments patient care, that increases autonomy for communities that don't have the same standard of care currently as tertiary care hospitals, um, can increase just-in-time learning, can increase our access to um, the newest guidelines, and uh, create a future of uh, a connected world and a connected Canada that not just meets the standard of care everywhere, but it seeks to surpass it. Um, so why does it matter? Because, again, to um, reiterate, immersive can make healthcare more accessible, uh, integrated, uh, and efficient. So um, that was a very quick overview of immersive and its applications for both space, for terrestrial applications. Um, if you have any questions, we can certainly entertain them. And then, if not, well, let's get to the headsets. There are six of you, so maybe we'll do two to a headset at a time, take turns, and then uh, in the, what time are we at here? We have um, 50 minutes left. Maybe every 15 minutes we'll swap. Um, so in maybe 15 minutes, every two of you can take turns at a station. Does that sound okay? Any questions at all? No? Is it really hot in here? Do you guys want to open the door? Yeah? Okay. Do you anticipate there being any like, patient hesitancy uh, when their physician is kind of behind a, mm -hmm. a dark screen? Um, like, do you think the patients might feel like they're not actually being attended to? Um, it kind of depends because um, not really. Because like when you're acquiring an ultrasound image anyways, either you're in a trauma scenario and it doesn't matter, like your patient may have a decreased level of consciousness, or if you're in a clinical setting, you're in a dark room anyways acquiring the images. 
So it doesn't take that much um, away from it. Uh, and if you're, like the, the folks who would be interacting with the patient would be the emergency physician, um, the ultrasound te technologist, the primary care doctor. Um, so it really, it doesn't create that much of a barrier because it doesn't overall change the interaction. Yeah, good question. Though. The, like the one thing that might, that would be valuable is oftentimes patients, it's kind of hard because we're now we're getting into scope of practice, but if you're an ultrasound technician, you can't formally report findings to a patient anyways. So oftentimes patients will want to see what's on the screen, um, but they can't formally report the findings. Um, in the ER, patients will be curious and want to see what's on the screen. So there is always an option to cast what you're seeing to um, a phone or to a tablet so they can see what you're seeing as well. Yeah. Other questions? All right, so I'm just gonna quickly check on the headsets and then maybe we'll set up a station here, a station here, and a station here. Um, I don't know. Um, I think everything's connected right now, so we should be okay. Um, please don't drop any of this. It's uh, a lot of money. I thought this was no risk. <laughs> <laughs> no risk to you. Risk to me if I have to explain to my bosses um, why I've dropped a ten thousand dollar program. Okay. So I'm gonna move this here. So we'll put the ultrasound station in. Okay. Oh, over here. So feel free to slip it on. Um, right when I last left off, the ultrasound screen was here, but if it has moved around, so you're using um, your trigger finger to kind of grab on and just move the screen. Um, who here has ultrasound experience? Okay. Um, tell you what, once I've set up the other folks, I can work on casting to my screen so I can kind of guide you through um, what we're, what, what to do. Um, and we'll, you can uh, image mine or someone else's radial artery. Okay, um, and if you want to just slip it on now and start playing around with it, you're welcome to. Um, okay, so this one, these ones will be virtual reality, so you won't be able to see through, so just you know, be mindful of where you are. Um, and then what happens is every time you move, you actually confuse it because it wants you to stay safe and it wants you to stay in a boundary. So right now, we've just walked out of the previous boundary. Yeah, so it's not too happy with me right now. But we'll do. Okay, it's convinced that this is your new boundary, so you're going to be here. You're going to be in a bit of a cage. It also has the transmission. It's actually a perception. Yeah, I'm going to try to get rid of this boundary for you because I think it's just going to interfere with everything we're seeing. Just hit play whenever you're ready. Yes. Sorry. Oh, this one, yeah. 
and there's a left-handed one here as well. Oh, do you want me to tighten that for you? Maybe a little bit. Yeah, okay. So, sorry, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Is that a little bit snugger? Yeah. Is that just to the top? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. No worries. I'm sorry. 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 I'm here since there's a boundary here and uh, right now you are in the back of an ambulance and there are some instructions up. Um, so you want to step over here. Right, do you want to step over here? Perfect. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> so there's a velcro strap up here. Okay. So you would just and the whole thing. Yeah. 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 Ye
Like it's mm -hmm. locked over there? It's like black. Yeah, it says you need to unlock it. Oh, uh, just draw a Z. Oh, a Z? Yeah. Also, I think I left the program. What was it called again? Oh, it's uh. <laughs> <laughs> I will be right there. Well, there's some cool boxing games on here. <laughs> what you're doing right now? Resist the urge. Resist the urge. Resist the urge. Wow. Oh, that's a YouTube on here. <laughs> If you want to Google uh, or look up the 360 videos on YouTube, you can certainly do that as well. You don't have to stay in the med tweets. Okay, so I'm going to draw the Z. Okay. So, we don't have to do anything. No. Okay. okay. Well, 
<laughs> that was really cool. Yeah. That was, I don't think I saw anything. <laughs> like, in the sense, like, I saw something, but I just said yeah. I could distinguish. Let me, let me see if I can image my own radial artery so you guys actually get a sense of what it's supposed to look like. Do you want to look at mine? Yeah, you know, I've already got Oh, out. sorry. And I just removed all of the stuff. Yeah, it's, I'm kind of throwing you guys to the fire for it because you just. You put it on yeah. the wrist? Yeah, yeah. More juice is better. And so yeah. you, and um, sure, yeah, basics yeah, of ultrasound, you always want to have like a nice um, kind of full length grip on it. So, and when I say full length, when we were there teaching us to scan, they taught us to use hold our phones first. Um, anyways, so you want your, your probe to the patient's right, or to the patient's head. Okay, that's the convention. Okay. So then, <laughs> so now I'm going to adjust my depth so it's da, 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 da. Maybe go to 3.5 centimeters and then No, it's okay. <laughs> Do you guys think your practice aren't lined on each other in second grade? On each other? Yeah, that's the fuck. That was my day. We <laughs> literally had to do that and like to put NG tubes in each other. Oh, oh, yeah, I feel oh. like that's a good thing to practice. No, it was terrible. On. It was terrible. But then you know. I, I know what it feels should have like. to like try high flow oxygen. I think we should all have to try it? most things, to be honest, because then we know how, if it's, is it necessary? Once yeah. I try to like, out of curiosity, that sounds terrible. Beautiful bones. Oh, you can see bones? Yeah, because they're shadows. So, for example, they're, they're, you see them as like okay, black, black see. shadows. <laughs> oh, sorry. Here, do you want to? Yeah, maybe I'll sit. Oh, you're sitting. I was going to say, then I'll be a little bit. A little bit less awkward. Have you tried this one? I have, yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. I might try this one. It's pretty excellent. Uh, it's like a potassium supplement. It's oh, okay. it has like cool. it's like coconut water that's super 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 salty. Like I do oh, not recommend. Okay. I was just curious one day and they had an extra one at the nursing station. Okay. I, yeah, it was I okay. was filled with instant regret. Hmm. It was just to slow down and like Did somebody at their pie meeting, they they went to see the doctor with the patient. Mm -hmm. and it's an endocrinologist and the endocrinologist put one of the like dexacon things on them. Yeah, I, I heard that. Was that? I think that's it was wild. Cool. What? Yeah. yeah. They yeah. put a dexcom on just a med student in the shadow? Yeah, yeah, so then he like tracked his like, glucose for like two weeks. Yeah. yeah. Really? It's yeah. really it's really addictive. So we did um, zero G and space flight testing with a freestyle libre. Um, and so I did it on myself in a parabolic flight and I was I was obsessed. Like after I ate anything. He was like telling us that he was like monitoring and like he's like he went out drinking and he's like so then his like glucose ate really low or whatever and he's like I was doing this he's like I really tested it like whole like plate of pierogies and ice cream and he's like it really spiked up he's like testing the long That's really cool. He's like really experimenting with it. Whoa. All right. Now I want to ask my patient mentor. You can see there. I don't full screen. Can I get a really good visualization here? But I don't, I don't drink very much water. I don't know if that. I think you should just drag it down. <laughs> okay, okay. So you figure it out. Oh my god, you're going to be So the nice thing was. Um, the nice thing with Did you make uh, it very nice. I think so. Oh, well, it's not full here. You said water? Okay. Right. Oh, pause. So and I can Where, see your tissues. There should be something that says not On your right there. side, there's a volume button if you wanted to Ooh. bring the volume down, like on the right side of your headset. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just sorry about that. <laughs> not even I can hear myself. Yeah. Okay. On the right side, you said. I'm going to move all over this. All over this. No. Oh, okay. So you said it was at the bottom. It's, it's on the bottom right on the bar. Does it say non-VR? Got a video yesterday, and it was like a message. Like, I'm not sure. 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 I'm not s
answer in school. I saw the recommend to me, I have not watched Wait, it yet. Is it a 360 video? It's, 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 it's a video. video. So I see it was your school. And is it 360? It's supposed to be smart, but it's supposed to be smart. Look at this place. There's a kitchen over there. My diary and you not. That's why you're skating. But then I got that recommended to me like yesterday and I haven't seen it yet. That's terrible. I mean, she's she's like a trooper. Okay. This video, she is doing great. I don't know if I would be. I don't think I would be. Oh, yeah. I see the non VR now. Oh, wait, no, I want 360. Right buck. Like, you have a very medial stuff showing up today. And it's probably because I'm using the wrong probe, but. So things are a little bit grainy. But the entire setup is still what you would expect to see. It's a bit grainy, but it is there in that field. I know it's freeze it here. It's really cool. I was just in the like living room area or whatever it's called. 
Is yeah, that a living room area? Yeah, it's yeah. like a tropical you can paradise. Look into it. Yeah, it's there's like a kitchen. And oh yeah, yeah. I, was, I was there in that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I had yeah, that's exactly. What it was. <laughs> I feel like I'm almost yeah, really down about it rather than staying because I'm so worried that I'm going to bump into something. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Is this normally where you throw your balls? Yeah, that's really cool. Did you finish the video? No. And then I didn't know how to get back. That's great. It was cool. I've seen like the shoulder reductions before. Yeah, I don't really know what I'm supposed to be seeing. Oh, oh, right, this screen. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, they're because it goes so <laughs> long. Yeah, so like I see a lot of colors, but oh, so you have to stand here inside your own. Ah, uh, like so you like have to put your hands in the back of the ambulance, and then you have instructions and directions. <laughs> so so yeah, and then um, it should still be within the boundary. Like, like, step yeah. outside the boundary. Okay. okay. Oh, 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 a little harder, maybe. So you're So the box is like a bit better. better. It's like just boxing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can grow too. Oh, I think I actually have a video. It's actually a really funny. So cool. It's like a but like, it's not as satisfying, you know? Okay, I'm gonna you. Yeah, but it just 